come before the court is the State of Ohio v. Carl Stanley Darby. Um, each of the parties will have up to 15 minutes for their arguments. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes. Um, if you are going to reserve time, please let me know because I will be keeping track of the time. Uh, the arguments are being recorded, so please keep your voices up and remain behind the podium. You should not use the names of children or minors or victims during your argument. You can refer to people um, by their initials and terms like the, the child in this instance. Uh, the judges have read your briefs and are ready to proceed when you are. Uh, would you like to reserve time? Yes, Your Honor. I would reserve three minutes. Okay, very good. Then we are ready when you are. I mean, because heaven's probably uh, worn out by now with some of the prior <laughs> arguments. So. Yes, Your Honor. Judge Carr, Judge Sutton, Judge Lanser. May it please this honorable court, I am Richard Kudati. I am court appointed counsel for Carl Stanley Darby Jr. I'm here to stand up for Carl. Um, I think he had an unfair trial. I think it was wrong below. Um, this also gives this court an opportunity to refine, maybe follow or detail um, what a verdict form needs to be. And here we have a manifest way argument, you know, um, manifest way, oral argument 101, always use manifest way if nothing else comes up. Well, in this case, manifest way is well founded and it is really a good and strong argument. I'll get into that. So we have a failure to comply with the order or a signal of a police officer. Not a good idea, by the way. Um, usually you want to um, listen to what the police say, especially when sirens and, and uh, uh, lights are following you. But the question here, when does it become a felony? Because in this case, the record does not support the notion that it should become a felony. So Carl, uh, my client wore orange well. And that's okay, except for he had to wear shackles well. He had to wear handcuffs well. I don't know why that was, but in this instance, MG on uh, April 18th had her car stolen, and somehow, um, as a result, Carl was charged with receiving uh, stolen property. He was found not guilty. Anyways, the Akron police were called, and uh, about the stolen car, they got behind Carl. His car was stopped uh, with the lights flashing, but uh, he left the scene and a chase ensued. Now, the passenger officer in the cruiser, Officer Shoemaker, is the main witness here. He says he didn't see the uh, speedometer, and thus he didn't know the speed. So he came up with this estimate at trial. So he testified, he's the one that testified, and he gave an opinion as to what was going on with the speed based on his training and experience. And he comes up with, oh, it's probably 50 miles per hour. He didn't know it specifically. There's really no evidence to that. So they lose sight of uh, Carl. He crests the hill, and when they get to the other side of the hill, well, Carl got into a car accident. Now, we don't know what, when or why in this car accident. But um, he was apprehended, and um, we now talk about, well, what are the risks involved in this big chase? So whatever happens, he's claimed to have substantial risk of physical for bodily harm. Okay, substantial risk. Let's talk about that for a second. What does substantial mean? So, an example would be, well, with the feds and the federal government, when you're giving a proffer and the snitch or the person, the informant, is giving evidence, they have to give substantial evidence, not just anything. And so when we look at the term substantial, it's very critical, especially in this case when we get to manifest weight or sufficiency, because substantial is a particularized term that is very important when we look at um, what provides for a reasonable doubt or proof beyond a reasonable doubt. 
In this instance, we then get to the officer who looks on the internet, finds a picture of Carl. Well, lo and behold, when he's giving testimony, he talks about warrants. Well, Carl has a warrant. So now we have an orange jumpsuit, a shackle, we have handcuffs, and we have a warrant on top of them. Well, there's a curative instruction on a request for a mistrial. The court erred in over uh, ruling that motion for mistrial. The prejudice is there when you couple it all together looking at the totality. I mean, really, I mean, there's a man, how, how would you feel? How would the jury feel when you know, oh, wait a minute, this guy's wanted, I mean, and he's running for so when you put the picture, the painting that the government portrays of this situation is all cumulative. So the prejudice was there for a wanted man for something. Counsel, I have a question. Um, my understanding is that Defendant Darty wanted to wear the orange suit that clothes were provided for him if he chose to wear the orange. Is that correct? That's my understanding. And Obviously, I wasn't there, but I believe that is correct, Your Honor. And the shackles, like if you're in custody, you do have shackles, but typically they're not seen by the jury the way they do that. So are you saying in Darby's case, it was something overt to the jury that he had shackles on as well? I would say that's true. I okay. wasn't there. There's no description or evidence of that in the that's record. That's what I was going to ask next. Is but there any description of how those shackles are displayed to the jury in the record? Well, Your Honor, we've all been there many, many a time. I mean, you don't hide shackles and, and handcuffs. It's it's obvious. And you couple that together. Uh, I'm with you on that. If it were me, we would be running back to the jail, and I'd be changing my client's clothes. Having said that, uh, let's take a look at this chase, the big chase. It wasn't a bullet. Have you ever seen the movie Bullet, where chases are really... Um, Prolific. This is not much of a chase. Look, the record is less than a mile for 25 seconds. Now, we've all had heard whatever chases. I know I have in many cases of failure to comply cases. This is not it. Um, and so the officer says, well, the policy wasn't disrupted. It wasn't really a big risk. But the big thing about it is if they're safe enough to travel this 50 miles per hour or whatever, but what's the evidence? So we don't have any evidence of uh, what the neighborhood was like, or you know, were there any people around? You know, in my at my office, at my farmhouse office. So it comes. There's Portage Lakes Drive. It comes off on the Cormany Road, and people just speed down there. And the thing about it is, when they're speeding 50 or more miles per hour, because I know this, there's no substantial risk. So, counsel, um, is is the fact First of all, this was a, uh, a neighborhood, is that correct? I did not know that. That's what's portrayed as the word in the record, Your Honor, yes. Okay, in the record. Um, and then with respect to evidence of the risk, is it evidence of the risk that it ended with a crash uh, into a telephone pole? That, and, and is that correct? Is it that is. What and what was the, uh, what, what happened to the car? Uh, was it, it was, total? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. But that does, I'm glad you raised that because the distinction of that is very critical. Okay. There's no causation. We don't know how it happened, why it happened. Was it the effect in the car? Was it from going fast? We don't know that because what's important, we add now another element. The, the stipulation was there that the officer who wasn't going to testify was saying, well, he was going 80 or over. Well, that's not what the stipulation that was read to the jury, and I believe that's critical. The word was that um, the stipulation was while the defendant was fleeing, um, he was caught, I'm sorry, the, the stipulation was while fleeing, Darty was driving over 80 miles an hour into a residential neighborhood. But that's not what was read. The, what was read was, while the defendant was fleeing, he clocked Mr. Darty driving his vehicle over 80 miles per hour in a residential area. Clock, that's a specific term. It means a specific time period. Counsel, is it your argument, however, that the stipulation should have read um, uh, 80 miles per hour anyway? Yes, that's what the stipulation was, Your Honor. It says, while fleeing, Darty was driving over 80 miles per hour. Now, having said that, okay, and I'm not here to disparage my colleague, 
but I believe that is ineffective. Uh, he was never caught. He was never cross-examined. And most importantly, uh, there's no obje objection. That is ineffective assistance. Not to disparage my colleague, I mean, I've raised ineffective assistance on myself at times, but this is plain error. Now, more importantly is the issue of this uh, verdict form. It does not comply. The Supremes have made a declaration in State v. McDonald. If you look at this verdict form, it does not, what it says is, it refers to the indictment. With an order to signal a police officer as charged in the indictment. I don't know if the indictment's in there or not. Was that an evidence? I don't see it as an exhibit. Um, so, is this substantial risk? And that's where the jury lost its way. So, I'll leave the mechanics of the uh, 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 attorney, uh, DiMartino, and I have both briefed that pretty thoroughly. So, I'll leave the mechanics of our argument to the verdict form there because it is pretty specific. But the most incredible uh, thing I will leave on that issue is that the verdict form does not comply with the Supreme Court of Ohio. And having looked at this verdict form, there is nothing that says what degree it is. Now, let's move in the manifest way. We talked sure, about- I, I do want to go back to that point because it doesn't have to have the degree if you have the aggravated factor found by the jury, and that is exactly what the jury did. It says, did cause substantial risk of serious physical harm. That's the, the, the part that makes it a felony. So the, the degree does not have to be on the verdict form if the aggravated factor is found by the jury, right? Partially right, yes. However, also what needs to be on here is the language. So you can't just, if the, the, the um, case is clear, you just can't refer, you have to have the language in there. But the jury gets the language from the jury instructions, right? No, no, Your Honor. The jury did the language relative to substantial risk, but it did not talk about it when it uh, uses the language required relative to Part A or Part B. Part B of the statute is the enhancement component. Um, the uh, final thing I would say, when we look at the notion of manifest weight um, and how the jury lost its weight, it was the cumulative uh, issue of what was presented. The orange jumpsuit, uh, there's no description whatsoever of this, the chase. We have a problem with the clock versus 80 miles per hour. We have the warrant language. We have orange shackled and um, cuffed. That is erroneous evidence that the jury relied upon. They lost their way. Thank you. You will have uh, three minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Good Kevin DiMartino on behalf of the State of Ohio and Valley. We are asking that this court affirm Mr. Darty's conviction for the failure to comply in violation of 29, 21, through 31. The state would argue that the verdict form does comply with 29, 45, 75. The conviction is supported by sufficient evidence and the weight of the evidence that the trial court did not err by denying Mr. Darty's motion for mistrial and he was not denied an effective assistance of counsel. I'd like to start with the verdict form argument. Um, with regard to failure to comply, whether you are convicted under A or B, the violation is still called failure to comply. So 2921331A is failing to comply with the order or signal police officer. 2921331B is still called failure to comply, but it's also willfully fleeing or trying to elude the police after that, that order or signal is given. 2945-75 says that when there's an additional element that elevates the degree of the offense, the verdict form has to state either the uh, felony level, whatever that enhancement is, or the additional elements. A and B are not the enhancement language. The enhancement language is the language that, by fleeing, you create a substantial risk of serious physical harm to persons or property during the commission of the offense. It is true that only B can be elevated. So in McDonald, the state versus McDonald, the court said 
The Verde form has to have that enhancement language, which is creating a substantial risk of serious physical harm to persons or property, which is in this verdict form. But the McDonald court also noted that it, they couldn't tell whether or not the defendant was also convicted of the B section or the A section. Not that it's because what enhanced the felony level, but because only B can be enhanceable. Pelfrey, State versus Pelfrey, which looked at 2945.75, says that that enhancement language, in order to comply with 2945.75, that has to be in the verdict form. You can't refer to the indictment for that enhancement language. It does not say that the other information cannot be referred to in the indictment. Here, everything that's required by Pelfrey and by McDonald, as far as the enhancement language, the substantial risk of serious physical harm, is in the verdict form. We know that the jury found Mr. Darty guilty of 292131B and not 292131A because the verdict form says, as charged in the indictment. There is no argument made that the jury was not properly instructed or that there's any inadequacy in the indictment. So this case complies with Pelfrey and it is distinguishable from State versus McDonald. There is sufficient evidence that the jury convicted on 292131B and the felony enhancement language is clearly stated on this verdict form. This verdict form is different from McDonald too because there's a separate spot to write in guilty of the offense of failure to comply. It also has the indictment reference and then it also has a separate spot for causing substantial risk of serious physical harm to persons or property. So based on the verdict form in this case, the reference to the indictment, not trying to include the enhancement language, but just going to whether it was subsection A or B, the verdict form in this case complies with 2945.75 as well as the Supreme Court cases that have come out with regard to what needs to be included in a verdict form. With regard to the argument about the conviction, the sufficiency and the weight of the evidence, when it gets to the stipulation, whether you use the word he was clocked at 80 or he was traveling at 80, the key is he is admitting he was going 80 miles per hour in a residential area. That's part of the stipulation. So the equivocation about whether or not it's a neighborhood or residential area, that has been removed. Any doubt about that because Mr. Darty stipulated to it. If speed, the actual speed, whether it was 59, 72, was an issue, then maybe you can make an argument about ineffective assistance at counsel because traveling at a speed or clocked at a speed would be the issue if it was a speeding ticket. But it wasn't. We're talking about while attempting to flee or elude the officer after being told to stop, did this defendant create a substantial risk of serious physical harm? And substantial risk and serious physical harm are all codified in the Ohio Revised Code. And as Your Honors pointed out, if you crash your vehicle, that is evidence that there was a risk of harm. And the risk is shown by the fact that he crashed. There's no doubt it was serious physical harm because the vehicle had to be towed. It was inoperable. So the evidence was that the police officers pulled up behind Mr. Darty. They put the lights on. They told him to stop his car. He kept driving. They put the sirens on. He willfully fled. The testimony at court was that he was going at least 50, probably more than that. They also had the stipulation about it being more like 80 degree, 80 miles per hour. This is a residential area. There's no allegation in the record that he didn't hear or see the police officer. He's just trying to argue that the word clocked versus traveled somehow makes him not willfully attempting to flee or creating a risk when he's traveling at an excessive speed in a residential area. So there is sufficient evidence in the record as well as the weight of the record supports that he was operating a vehicle, avoiding the police officer's signal or order to stop, and was doing so in a way to elude the officers and creating a substantial risk of serious physical harm to persons or property. With regard to the mistrial allegation, the only basis, the only time that they asked for a mistrial at the trial court was based on the officer saying that because Mr. Darty gave the wrong first name, he was trying to identify who Mr. Darty was, and he looked at the quote homepage, which he said is a place where they have pictures of people with warrants, and then the objection was put into the record. 
He didn't testify that Mr. Darby had a warrant. He said that he looked at the home page where people are listed with warrants. The court gave a curative instruction, basically saying, you know, he may or may not be true that he had a warrant. Don't consider that in any way and to disregard it. Now, the law is clear that there's a presumption that juries follow curative instructions. And again, they did not, the officer did not say that Darby actually had a warrant. He was just describing what the home page was. This was an isolated statement with the curative instruction. So even if it was error, it was harmless error, there's overwhelming evidence with regard um, to his guilt in this case.